jump in. Um, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for coming to join our 16th annual HMP meeting. Um, we've got a full agenda, like I mentioned, so I think I'm just going to jump on in. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to mention up front is that this meeting will be recorded and we will do our best to uh, post it on the website as soon as we can. Um, I guess I haven't introduced myself. My name is Roseanne Humphrey and I'm the Habitat Management Plan Coordinator for the City of Carlsbad. We're in the um, Environmental Management Department of the city. And this year we are having our first virtual format. Normally we have an in-person meeting, which is a little more interactive um, and it, it's uh, easier to have interactive conversations and questions and answers. Um, we've got such a full agenda that we may not have time for questions at the end. Um, in case that happens, you can please feel free to ask any questions, whether it's to me or the preserve managers to my email, um, which is up on the screen, and we will be sure to get you an answer. You can try sending a chat and we will um, try to make sure those questions are answered. But again, it all just depends on how much time we have. And lastly, I wanted to mention that um, the HMP annual report, triennial monitoring report, all the presentations and the meeting recording will be available on the web page. So if you feel like coming back later or referring somebody else, um, that'll, that'll all be up. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to mention that because this is a virtual format, Zoom meetings can be a little tedious after a couple hours. So we decided to uh, cut it down to an hour and a half. We'll see how that goes um, just so we can focus on the talks and not just sort of inundate people with, with too much Zoom time. So with that, um, oh yeah. So the, the process today is I'm going to give some highlights from our HMP annual report for the year 2020. And then I'm gonna hand it off to the preserve steward and the preserve managers, and they're all gonna give um, short presentations about everything they've been doing. And then we will wrap up and that should get us to the end. Okay, so um, the map you see on your screen is the current status of our HMP preserve system. So the dark green areas on the map are permanently conserved and that adds up to about 6,200 acres in total. And that's about 96% of our target. So we are getting very close to uh, reaching our target. And uh, I also included some red circles on the map because there's various things I'm gonna be talking about today and I wanna make sure you know where in the city these things are. Um, I always like to, I'm always a visual person. I like to kind of know where these things sit. Um, so here's just a quick map of that. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about, which was not on the map um, is in 2020, we fully completed our obligation for the Nat Catcher core area credit. And for, for those of you who don't know what that means, um, in the 1990s, when the Habitat Management Plan was being developed, the wildlife agencies determined that there was not enough coastal sage scrub in the city to permanently conserve the coastal California gnat catcher. So the city promised it, it had an obligation then to come up with 307.6 acres of either restoration or acquisition or conservation within what was identified as the gnat catcher core area, which is the red circle you see on the map. And <clears throat> so that's about half in Carlsbad and half outside of Carlsbad. The area was identified as being critical to the survival of the species. So with through the purchase of 12.9 acres of net catcher core area credit in 2020, we have finally uh, fulfilled that obligation in full. Um, another accomplishment in 2020 was the purchase of a 15.1 acre or a circle property. 
Um, this was an exciting purchase because this property was ready to be developed. It had entitlements and permits and it was ready to go. The developer decided to sell it and the city was able to purchase it using um, Prop C money. And uh, so although 9.5 acres had already been proposed for permanent, uh, permanent uh, preservation, 5.6 acres of that property was um, slated for development. So now with the city's purchase, the entire 15 acre property will be added to the HNP and it's already been put under long-term management by Center for Natural Lands Management. Um, now I wanna talk about the Ward's Weed Eradication Program. For those of you who don't know what Ward's Weed is, it's a highly invasive species. It's relatively new. It's from the Mediterranean re region. It's related to mustards and it's a very, very aggressive spreader. 98% of the entire population in the Western Hemisphere occurs in Carlsbad in this Bressy Ranch location. So we have a very rare opportunity to eradicate this species before it spreads across the United States. So in 2020, we completed phase one of the eradication program, which was treating intensive treatment with a pre-emergent herbicide that works on seeds, uh, keeps them from, from growing, and it's called gallery. So that has been completed. And now we're in phase two, which is surveillance and maintenance. So we will just keep our eyes on things. And if we see a, a new hotspot, we will take care of it immediately. Um, and that process will be a few years. So uh, we just started that. Um, this was a pretty big undertaking. So I want to give a shout out to our partners, um, Jason Giesau, County of San Diego, Nature Collective, Center for Natural Lands Management, and even though it's not up here, ACS um, Habitat Restoration, which was our contractor. Um, it was a really great team and, and we really um, came far with that team. Um, another highlight in the same area, which is super exciting, is the dark green area you see on your map is the 173-acre Bressy Ranch, which is now under long-term management by San Diego Habitat Conservancy. And the reason why this is such a big deal is because all of the wars weed infested area, which is the hatched area on this map, everything except for those two small fragments on the left-hand side, we're on unmanaged preserves, which is probably why it spread so far out of control so quickly. So now the majority of the infected area is now on managed land. So that, that's a huge deal for us and we're very excited about that. Another accomplishment, uh, we got vernal pool species coverage through our habitat management program for six vernal pool species uh, through the uh, Poinsettia Station Vernal Pool Preserve. This preserve was established in 1995, and um, now it, it was unmanaged up until a few years ago when the city decided to take over management. And so now the city's partnering with uh, Vernal Pool experts at DUDEC, and we have done rare plant surveys, hydrological monitoring, and intensive um, weeding by hand in the vernal pools um, of this area. So it's, it's already starting to look a whole lot better. And then lastly, I want to share two really interesting obser observations that we made in 2020. Um, there's a new species that was observed called the prairie false brome. It was thought to have been extinct, and even when it was not extinct, it was thought to only occur in uh, Mexico. But these two amazing botanists, Jesse Vinge and Margie Mulligan, found it in Carlsbad living, which is a super exciting finding. We don't um, find new species, especially those that were considered extinct very often. So that, that's a really super exciting thing, and it was in Carlsbad. So they are going to do more surveys this spring and see if they can find new locations of the species. 
And lastly, uh, a mountain lion observation. So we, we keep hearing um, reports, but we've never had them corroborated. A lot of times it turns out to be a bobcat or something like that, but we have confirmed evidence that there was mountain lion in the eastern part of the city. Um, and you, as you can see from the tracking studies done on the map on the left, all the colored dots are from collared animals that show their movement patterns. And as you can see, they really don't occur in coastal San Diego anymore. I think there's just not enough habitat. They have huge home ranges. So it's exciting whenever we see a really gorgeous, huge uh, predator like this in Carlsbad. Um, we think it's likely to be a young male that was passing through looking for a new territory. But um, the fact that we have evidence that that actually occurred which is really exciting for us. And that is it for my presentation. I wanted to remind everybody, please feel free to send me comments or questions. Um, I'm going to pass it on to the next speaker. Before I do that, I just want to say the next speaker is Alana Sullivan. And I just want to give her a shout out. Alana is um, exploring new options. So she is, she is moving from the preserved steward position onto a new adventure. And I just wanted to give her a shout out. She's been working as my right hand person for um, seven years or so. She's done an amazing job working with preserve managers and doing wildlife studies and post fire studies. And she's just been really great to work with. So thank you to Alana. And Alana will be passing the baton over to Adrian Lee. Adrian, you can give a quick wave. Um, Adrian's been working with Alana for a couple of years. So she's already been plugged in and is ready to go. So I just wanted to, to say thank you to both of you. And now I will pass it on to Alana. Thanks, Roseanne. Can you guys see my cursor here? In yep. blue? Okay making sure I'm sharing the right screen. Um, so, okay. Yeah, that was great. Um, so hi everyone, nice to be here in my home. Um, my name is Alana Sullivan. I'm an environmental biologist and I've been involved with the preserve stewardship contract for, with the city for about six years. Um, my main task as preserve steward is to help oversee the management and monitoring of Carlsbad Habitat Management Plan, their HMP. Um, about every three years, we put together a triennial monitoring report. So what is the triennial monitoring report? Um, since 2004, when the HMP was finalized, uh, special status plant and animal monitoring data is collected annually by preserve managers across all the established preserves. So we receive annual reports from preserve managers with monitoring data, and then we compile that data into one citywide annual report. And every three years, we put together a triennial report, which compiles all of the Carlsbad monitoring data from when the monitoring began. So sometimes it's 2004, sometimes it's 2013. It's whenever the preserve was formally established and long-term management began. So this is a part of a requirement of the HMP, um, but it also just helps us track the management and monitoring actions and status across these species. So here, I know it's probably really small and hard to see, uh, but this is a table within the report where you can see the preserve names, where preserves are, uh, where species are monitored. You can see the land manager, you can see what species are monitored for and which years. Um, so we look at 10 plant species and nine wildlife species. And this is just a good overview uh, if you wanna reference what, what, when and where was monitored. So what information is presented within the report? So for each species, we look at critical locations, um, which are an area that the MHCP has identified that must be conserved. And this often coincides with major populations of the species, not always. We look at long-term monitoring. So um, specifying what monitoring actions are being done, the frequency of monitoring, is there a complete census count, just sampling, um, et cetera. We look at the status, so basically the results of monitoring. This is where you find our tables, results tables, 
and we try to include a statement about the overall health of the species within Carlsbad. We look at major threats such as invasive plants for threadleaf brodea, fire for coastal California gnatcatcher predators for California least tern, and then management actions to protect these species. So management actions typically coincide with threats um, such as invasive plant removal, predator control, etc. And then just here's one species in the report um, I wanted to highlight. So the coastal California gnatcatcher. This is a federally threatened species, a California species of special concern, and it's covered under the HMP. Uh, originally, this species was planned to be monitored once every three years, but uh, we did monitoring in 2010 and 2013 across 1,500 acres of suitable habitat. And um, pop the population was shown to be steady and well distributed <clears throat> across its coastal sage scrub habitat. So with approval from the wildlife agencies, monitoring is now performed every nine years. And the next survey is gonna be done next year in 2022. So in Carlsbad, the biggest threat to the species is habitat degradation due to things such as fire, invasive species, human trespass, uh, et cetera. And the gnat catcher is managed locally on these preserves via protection of their habitat and restoration of their habitat. So here's a figure from the triennial where you can see I think I got muted. You can you hear me? Okay. Where you can see that gnat catcher is fairly well distributed throughout preserves. Um, let's see, one last thing about gnat catchers. They sound like a tiny kitchen mewing. Did you hear that? It's a very small little mew. So that's their call. Um, here's my little gimmick. And that's it. So as you guys heard, moving on from the preserve stewardship role. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you. Um, to Roseanne, the city, and all the preserve managers. You all have been super awesome, and it's been so fun to work with you. So, good work. Thank you, Alana. That was wonderful. Um, trying to figure out how to stop sharing. There we go. Okay, so then next up, we have Kathleen Pollitt and Vince Rivas from San Diego Habitat Conservancy. They're going to talk about their management efforts to conserve San Diego thornmint and threadleaf brodea. All right, I'm trying to share my screen, but it says only host. Uh oh. Oh, oh, good now, good now. All Perfect. right, you can all see my screen. Yep. All right. Sorry, it might be a little bit of a delay because I'm remote accessing. Do you uh, want to put it on um, presentation mode? There you go. Should be, yeah, sorry, I was delaying, but there oh, we go. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. All right, well, hello everyone. My name is Vince Rivas and I'm here with my teammate, Kathleen Paulette. We are habitat managers for the San Diego Habitat Conservancy and we help to manage over 30 properties throughout the San Diego County. Today, we wanted to highlight a few of our ongoing management activities, as well as efforts to conserve and protect two of our rare and endangered plant species, the San Diego thornmint and threadleaf brodea. So we wanted to begin with the Quarry Creek Preserve and the growing concern with trespassing and wastes. Uh, situated near commercial and residential development, this site has had a long history with trespassing and transient activity. In the past, we regularly coordinated with local authorities to assist with patrols of high traffic areas and removal of individuals. However, this past monitoring year, we have faced a significant increase in trespassing and encampments, which has increased the presence of trash, damage to vegetation, and ultimate threat to wildlife, including the sensitive Lee Spells Vario, which is shown here. And these issues have been especially concerning within the eastern portion of the preserve near the El Salto Falls area and along Buena Vista Creek. So this portion of the creek is the most upstream inlet for the preserve's watershed. So the waste and contaminants that enter this area will continue to move through the rest of the preserve. Additionally, the El Salto Falls, shown on the top right, is a sacred site for the San Luis Rey Band of Mission Indians. So it's a protected cultural resource as well. 
We speculate that the increase of trespasser activity has been due to the pandemic in which folks with cabin fever are simply looking for areas to explore while homeless individuals continue to move uh, from areas that are hidden from the public. We've addressed part of this concern last year in which we identified several websites that were promoting trespassing at the falls and promptly requested that this information be removed. Since then, we have noticed much less foot traffic, trash, and graffiti within the falls area. And we have also made strides to prevent homeless from moving into the preserve with the installation of a gate and fencing along the northeast boundary at College Boulevard. However, uh, we are still seeking additional barriers around the entirety of the site. So that figure there just shows the location of the gate and fencing, which has made a significant inc increase, as I mentioned. Um, but until then, we are dealing with the waste within the preserve with our network of volunteers and available resources. Although trash was not a foreseen long-term management duty, we regularly utilize our maintenance contractors for dump removal efforts in conjunction with supplemental volunteer cleanups. Volunteer events such as this have also been a great opportunity for stewardship outreach and community engagement. Last August, we worked with volunteers from a local high school environmental club to perform graffiti abatement within the falls area and removal of debris along the creek. For our recent volunteer cleanup last month, we partnered with the nonprofit, A Cleaner San Diego County, and our contractor, Black Sage Environmental, to tackle areas along the creek with more dense waste. So here are a couple photos from our recent cleanup, which show just how polluted areas of the creek can be. Volunteers work to remove items such as clothing, food packaging, kitchen utensils, electronic devices, shopping carts, and even furniture, which were usually partially buried or intermixed with vegetation. Although it was disheartening to see all this waste in such a beautiful habitat, I was truly impressed at how much we achieved. By the end of the day, we had removed just over 3,300 pounds of trash. The bottom right shows our group in front of a nearly half full 40 yard dumpster, but there is still enough waste in this area to fill several of these dumpsters. I'm hoping to get a larger volunteer group together for another cleanup on April 24th. So everyone be sure to mark your calendars. Another preserve that we manage is Laurel Tree Lane, which is located near the 24 hour fitness on Palomar Air Airport Road. And it's a riparian preserve on Encinas Creek. And in 2020, through a internship project that we had with a student, one polyphagous shot hole bore was detected. And as many of you know, this polyphagous shot hole bore arrived in San Diego in about 2014 and was responsible for decimating thousands of native and agricultural uh, trees and shrubs. Most notable was the Tijuana Slough, where we've seen great regrowth come back in just the last year. However, we're all waiting to see if this pathogen is also going to take advantage of the regrowth and come back in high numbers. So when we detected this uh, pathogen and pest in our preserve, we started by having a tree specialist camp come out who suggested that we inject a fungicide into the trees in order to kill the fungus and prevent the trees from getting the fungus. But after some research on that, because the trees are in a waterway, um, they probably wouldn't take up the fungicide. And because it would only last a couple of years, it wouldn't really be a long-term solution. So from there, we contacted the county who is implementing a grant from the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. And they came out and took uh, pathology samples and had those tested and found the fusarium, uh, the fungus that the beetle farms. So we're actually meeting on site today, later today to, to discuss what actions we may take and uh, we'll, we'll keep people updated on that. But in the future, what we definitely want to do is take cuttings like uh, from a tree where you cut part of it that you can just put in the ground to grow and inoculate that with a probiotic that's being developed by Dr. Escalon, who's a specialist on this pest. And then we can grow species and, and individuals that are resilient to the, to the pest. And next door to this preserve, we have the Emerald Point Preserve that has the federally and state listed San Diego thorn mint. And 
we started last year partnering with the San Diego Zoo Native Seed Bank to collect seed to have on reserve for this species in several of our preserves. And also we worked with the San Diego Management and Monitoring Program to fund seed banking or growing them out and getting more seed so that we could expand the population. Unfortunately, the, the, uh, the population here didn't express last year but we are preparing a larger area for um, hoping that we will be able to expand the population. And that's through a collaboration with a group called Pacific Ecological. And they have uh, written a restoration plan and started implementing restoration. And this was all pro bono, which we're really appreciative of since uh, this infestation came to us without management uh, monies for, for that portion of the preserve. So we're, we're hoping that uh, in the future, we'll be able to expand that population more. And uh, another preserve that we have that Vince will talk about. Also yeah. Have so yeah, we're also working with the San Diego Zoo to increase a local population of Thornment at the uh, Carlsbad Raceway Preserve. We have noticed a decline in the population over the past several years. So in order to preserve the species, we coordinated with the zoo to collect seed from individuals on site which will, be, which will be bulked to increase available seed reserves, as well as stored for future conservation efforts. The photos below display our recent efforts with the bottom left displaying the ripe whorls that contain the seed, which were collected last fall. And more recently, we collected and tested soil samples from, poten from potential transplant locations within the preserve in order to identify areas with suitable conditions for expanding this population. And in order to prepare for future seeding and planting efforts, we're, we are also solarizing the potential transplant areas as shown on the bottom right. And we'll continue to focus on hand removal in the vicinity to avoid mortality to the dormant. And uh, we're also excited to announce that we are now managing the 174 acre Bressy Ranch Preserve here in Carlsbad. We will be visiting this site every other month with our first round of vegetation mapping and rare plant surveys uh, scheduled for this spring. Based on our uh, observations so far, the main challenges on site are, are, are the invasive plants and trespassing issues. The top photo was taken during our most recent site visit last month in an area with new dirt jumps and trails. Areas such as this will be a focus for signage and um, focus monitoring to assess for potential fencing needs. Additionally, the preserve contains an array of invasive plants, which, have all, the, which all have the potential to reduce native biodiversity. The photo uh, on the bottom shows um, some of our moderate to high ranked invasives, including mustard, pampas grass, and tamarisk, all circled in red there. And not to mention, this preserve has one of the original known populations of Ward's weed, a more recent threat to, native, uh, to our native habitats, which Roseanne mentioned earlier. Here are some representative photos that we were provided with um, in, an, in a species identification guide. This small herbaceous plant was first observed within the preserve area in 2008 and has sin since spread to several areas throughout the county. The city of Carlsbad has led the effort to contain and eradicate this new invasive threat before it becomes out of control. Um, but now that it, this area is under our management, it'll be one of our top priorities uh, during this first year to make sure that we don't allow it to spread any further. We also plan to start management of the Sonata Preserve, which is just south of Rancho Santa Fe. It's a small preserve, but it has a translocated population of orcuts and threadleaf brodea that are federally and state listed. We'll be monitoring it uh, multiple times a year and doing vegetation mapping. And most importantly, we'll be taking over the vegetation uh, control, the invasive species control to make sure that this population persists. So this spring, the uh, management is being done by the owner. And then once that is completed, we will be taking over management and focusing on the, on the listed species. And that's the end of our presentation. Were you gonna do questions now or at the end? I think it was at the end. Yeah, we're gonna try to wait till the end just to see how much time we have left since it's a very packed agenda, but nice job, you guys. Yeah, thank you. Very exciting to hear what everybody's up to. Um, okay, so next, <clears throat> next up we have 
um, Lindsay Mobley uh, with Dudek, who is the preserve manager for Manzanita Partners Preserve. Okay, can everyone hear me and see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, yeah, I'm Lindsay Mobley. I'm a habitat ecologist with DUDEC and I'll be telling you about the Manzanita Partners Preserve today. Um, here we go. First, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction and the background of the preserve, and then I'll let you know about some of the special status species we have on site. And then I will go into some of our key management activities we have going on. Um, so, Manzina Partners Preserve is a 32.09 acre preserve located in South Carlsbad, right off um, El Camino Real. The conservation easement was recorded on October 24th, 2003. And the preserve is owned by Manzina Partners LLC, Conam Management Corporation, it's a management entity, but HRS or Habitat Restoration Sciences Inc. and DUDEC are providing habitat management services. So like annual maintenance and monitoring of the site. Um, something that's pretty cool about the site is that there's 14 vernal pools. Um, Conam enhanced seven existing pools on site for a total of 0.16 acres. And then they created or restored an additional seven vernal pools for a total of 0.12 acres. Um, they also restored 5.56 acres of coastal sage scrub habitat. And this work was all completed back in 2005. Now we'll go into discussing some of the special status species we have on site. Um, some sensitive plant species include Eastwood manzanita, which is a federally endangered species right down here on the bottom left. Um, another species is San Diego button celery, which is the middle picture here. Um, this species is located in our vernal pools. Um, it was observed last year in the 2019-2020 monitoring period. It's a 1B1 federally and state endangered species. Um, there's wart stem cyanothus, which is the picture over on the bottom right. We also have summer holly and ashy spike moss. Um, some sensitive wildlife species observed on site have been San Diego fairy shrimp. Um, we found San Diego fairy shrimp in four of the pools during the 2019-2020 monitoring period. And um, this is an endangered species. We also have coastal California gnat catcher and San Clemente loggerhead shrike. Um, coastal California gnat catcher Surveys are gonna be conducted in 2022, just as Alana mentioned earlier. Um, and then I'll briefly talk to you about some of the key management activities. Um, there was a fire that impacted the site back in 2014. So post-fire monitoring was conducted from 2015 to 2019. That work has now been completed. Um, but we do conduct vernal pool monitoring annually, um, mostly just after rain events to see if there's pooling and um, anecdotal monitoring of fairy shrimp utilizing photography and that sort of thing. We don't do protocol surveys. Um, we also have California gnat catcher monitoring, as I previously mentioned, and rare plant monitoring, both of which will be conducted in 2022. Um, and then HRS conducts periodic weed control. It's primarily for mustards, pampas grass, um, erodium within the vernal pools. Um, and trash and trespassing is definitely an ongoing issue within the preserve. So they conduct periodic trash removal um, annually. And that's about it. Thanks so much for your time. Great, thanks, Lindsay, that was wonderful. Um, next up, we have 
Gabriel Penaflor from California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, who is going to talk about management and monitoring in the ecological reserves. Okay, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Tell me when you can see it. Yep. We can see it. Okay, great. So yeah, I'm gonna be presenting for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And this is the Carlsbad HMP 2020 update. Doesn't wanna move. There we go. So this map might be familiar. These are all the, the five major ecological reserves that the department manages in Carlsbad. You have Batiquitos Lagoon, Agua Herianda Lagoon, Carlsbad Highlands, Buena Vista Lagoon, Buena Vista Creek, and other smaller properties. This is an example of one of the smaller properties that the department has. This is the Brodia filifolia site. We have this because it has a substantial population of the threadly Brodea. It is a federally threatened and state endangered species. This property was formerly owned by the Environmental Trust. And after that organization went under, the department took ownership to insert conservation of this significant population through management and protection. Management actions on the site include invasive weed removal by mechanical means, hand removal, as well as herbicide application. We also conduct IMG rare plant monitoring. So for the California Natcatcher surveys, this is the list of the properties that we conduct sprays on. At Carlsbad Highlands, we have nine breeding pairs. At Batarquitos Lagoon, we have six breeding pairs. At Agua Herianda Lagoon, we have three breeding pairs. And at Buena Vista Creek, there are also three breeding pairs. So this is a photo of Batarquitos Lagoon. At Batarquitos Lagoon, the department manages three productive California lease for nesting sites. These Two of the sites are found on the west of I-5, which is W-1 and W-2. There is one site east of I-5, which is E-1. W-1 is two acres, W-2 is four acres, and E-1 is 17 acres. Last year was a down year for the California lease turn, and Batacus was no exception. Nest totals last year for W-2 were six nests and four fledgings, and typically we can have anywhere from 600 to 650 nests, and we typically see 50 to 75 fledglings. For W1, we had 93 nests and around 30 to 40 fledglings. On E1, we had 40 nests and 15 to 20 fledglings. The management is focused on the prepping and serving of these nesting sites, which include invasive weed removal, herbicide application, and also repairing the chick bench, which keeps the chicks on site. We have also, we have a population of Acme Sprom prostratus on W2, which is surveyed using IMG rare plant monitoring protocol. Currently, the department is also developing a land management plan, which consists of conducting various surveys to form a baseline for the lagoon, as which will hopefully inform management decisions moving forward in the future. So dredging, dredging is also a huge part of Bad Kito's Lagoon. As you can see here, this is a picture of the, the dredge that was in the Central Lagoon and then the retention basin that we had on South Ponto State Beach. Dredging increases the tidal prism of the lagoon, which benefits the entire lagoon system. The department was able to complete a dredging cycle that started at the end of 2019 and was able to finish at the beginning of 2020. This involved, this management activity involved getting permits and approvals from various entities such as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Army Corps of Engineers, California Coastal Commission, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, State Parks and Rec, and the State Lands Commission. Surveys needed for this project are Calerpa surveys, eelgrass, water quality, bathymetric, and surf monitoring. All these surveys were needed pre and post dredging. The total amount of sand that was dredged from the central basin was 100 14,512 cubic yards. The sand was deposited on South Ponto State Beach in the retention basin that you see here. The purpose was that was to keep the majority of the sand on the beach to increase recreational opportunities at the beach. To avoid disturbance to the nesting birds at this lagoon, the dredging was conducted 
November through February. So this is a picture of a cute California least turn chick. And uh, the California least turns actually nest at Batacleus Lagoon annually. W2 is typically the most productive site, even though it is one of the smallest sites that we have, but which unfortunately wasn't the case last year. Department staff monitor all the nesting sites throughout the season. The nesting site production is a testament to the wonderful predator control contractor that, that the department partners with, which is USDA APHIS. Without the predator control, we wouldn't have any fledglings to speak of. So they do a wonderful job and we are very, very grateful. Here is a list of all of the predators that hassle the colonies that we manage. So as you can see, it's quite extensive and they need to have a well-rounded tool set to help us produce any fledglings at all. Currently, the snowy plovers only use Batiquitos as a wintering site. They don't nest there, but hopefully we're hopefully we'll change that in the future, but we'll see. So the light-footed ridgeways rail. During the last annual survey of the light-footed ridgeways rail, there were 32 breeding pairs at Batiquitos Lagoon. Agua Hadianda Lagoon has seven breeding pairs. Buena Vista Lagoon has 10 breeding pairs. The department also is partnering with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Idaho Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, and USGS on a study of survivability and management of the light-footed bridgeways rail. This study is at Batacules Lagoon and the Tijuana Estuary. The project is focused around installing GPS transmitters to captive bread rails as well as wild-caught birds then release these birds in either Batiquitos or Tijuana Estuary to better understand the movement and survivability of this bird. So at Agua Head Down to Lagoon and Agua, we are focused on invasive removal. We focus on a Limonium ramosissimum infestation that you can see on the left. So our strategy for this effort is an integrated approach that includes herbicide treatment in combination with hand removal and tarping. Agua Hedionda Lagoon Foundation is a vital partner in this effort. Without them, we wouldn't be able to incorporate tarping, which has been vastly, vastly superior in removal of this terrible, terrible weed. So also at this property, there is an ongoing passive restoration site that's taking place on the Park Drive restoration site. Previously, the Park Drive restoration site was dominated by Brassica Niagara, but now is dominated by native CSS. However, the trickier graviolans is popping up, so we have to remain vigilant. And you can see the picture on the right is the, the trickier graviolans. Another concern at this property we have is the illegal access of flotation devices that enter the, the river mouth into the reserve from the larger lagoon. In the larger lagoon, flotation devices are allowed, but we need to educate the public on where they can and can't be. So we are looking into installing buoys with department signage to increase public awareness. Carlsbad Highlands. This is one of the properties where we have uh, a lot of issues dealing with. So efforts right here are focused on the removal of trail hazards, such as these illegal bike jumps and berms that you can see on the left. These trail hazards degrade the user experience of legal trail users, as well as contribute to habitat destruction and erosion since large holes are dug to create them. During the past year, we removed 13 large jumps and berms. There seems to be a dedicated group of mountain bikers intent on rebuilding these jumps as we take them out. We're working with our law enforcement division to address this rampant habitat destruction. As you can see on the picture to the top right, they are have been ripping up our signs and completely disregarding them. So we need to increase public education and enforcement as well. We also have a partnership with the US Fish and Wildlife Service to collect narrow leaf milkweed seed to help improve the monarch butterfly forage and habitat. And you can see that here on the bottom right, those purple little blobs are bags to collect the seeds. The seed is very fine and is wind blown. So those bags help collect that seed. At Buena Vista Lagoon, at this reserve, we focus on invasive removal, management of the fishing areas, removal of feral calf feeding stations, and cleanup of trash, dumping, and unauthorized encampments. A partnership with Buena Vista Lagoon Audubon helps maintain and improve a small trail around the Lagoon Nature Center. Over the past year, 25 feral calf feeding stations have been removed, as you can see on the right. Typically, it's dry and wet food. So there's a dedicated group who wants to continue this 
feeding of these feral cats. This feeding promotes the presence of an apex predator in the lagoon where light-footed ridge waves rails are present. And then over on the left, you can see an example of a typical unauthorized encampment. There's many different forms of trash as well as sharp, so it is a hazardous situation, but we be cleaned up as we find that. So that's all I have. Here's my contact information. If anyone has any questions, you can shoot me an email. That's the best way to get a hold of me. And I will stop sharing now. Thank you very much. Roseanne, you're on mute. I just unmuted myself. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Gabriel. That was great. It's it's great to know what's going on on the reserves. Our next speaker is Gretchen Cummings from. Urban Core Habitat Services. So I will pass it on to her. All right. Morning, everybody. Uh, let me get my share screen up. There we go. Okay. So good morning, everybody. I'm Gretchen Cummings. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Urban Core Habitat Services in Carlsbad today. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about the Urban Core itself. And then I'm going to talk about the biological resources at each of the five preserves that they manage. Um, so not many people are familiar with not many people are familiar with the Urban Corps of San Diego. Uh, it's a small nonprofit organization that's a local conservation corps uh, based down in San Diego. Uh, they have a new satellite office in Escondido, which was very exciting uh, this past year because uh, they have been expanding. The organization uh, was created over 30 years ago with a mission of learning, earning, and conserving. Uh, some of the community services that the Urban Corps provides include graffiti abatement, homeless cleanup camp or camp cleanups, tree trimming, recycling, uh, residential repairs, and uh, most recently habitat management. Uh, the workforce of this organization is comprised of young men and women uh, ages 18 to 26 called core members. Uh, they have rotating schedules of school and work uh, throughout the week so that they can get on the job chaining while still getting a paycheck and earning their high school diploma. Uh, so for habitat management services, the on the job training includes uh, how to use small tools such as weed whackers and chainsaws and as shown here, it uh, looks like they've got some of the clouds. Um, they, the core members, they receive in the field training from me uh, on non-native and native plant identification, uh, the vegetation communities that are in the preserves, and why they have to do certain habitat management techniques in sensitive areas. If they have sensitive uh, birds or sensitive plants, uh, they learn about those and, and why it is they're doing what they're doing. Uh, the knowledge and skills that they obtain while they're at the Urban Corps helps these young people to get a job once they graduate. Uh, my role as a preserve manager, as I said, is to train these young people and hopefully inspire them about the natural environment. And also I, I conduct all the biological surveys that are required at these preserves. Uh, so uh, the Urban Corps started providing preserve management 11 years ago. And I am proud to say that I have been working with them as their biologist ever since that time. Uh, we currently manage 17 preserves throughout the county of San Diego. Uh, our smallest preserve is four hundredths of an acre right here in Carlsbad, and our largest one is 124 acres out in Borrego Springs. Uh, so five of these uh, 17 preserves are found right here in Carlsbad, and they are the City Ventures Preserve, the Newcrest Preserve, Southern Preserve, Paseo del Norte Preserve, and Point Fedia Place Preserve. So the first preserve I want to show you is that smallest one. It is the four hundredths of an acre preserve. Uh, it is located uh, south of uh, Poinsettia Lane and east of Black Railroad at the cul-de-sac of Newcrest Court. Uh, as you can see in this photo, the preserve did burn, unfortunately, during that Poinsettia fire in May of 2014. The photo on the left uh, was from 2016, just a year and a half after the fire happened, and then again in uh, last year, February of 2020. So you can see uh, that the chaparral habitat has recovered uh, since that time, since the fire burned in 2014. All right, um, 
so the New Crest Preserve, because it is so small, there's only one sensitive plant species and one sensitive wildlife species noted within the site. Uh, the sensitive wildlife species is the orange sword whiptail, and the sensitive plant is the wart stem ceanothus, and that's the one pictured on the bottom left. Uh, to protect these two sensitive species uh, and the chaparral habitat that they occur in, uh, Urban Corps uh, focuses on trash pickup along the fence line and also the weed removal of some non-native invasives such as the crown daisy shown in the photo on the right and the mustard plant. Okay, next one, next reserve I want to show you is the Paseo del Norte Preserve. Uh, this is a 1.4 acre site located uh, south of Palomar Airport Road in between Interstate 5 and uh, Paseo del Norte Road. Uh, Encinas Creek crosses the property along the southern part of the site um, from east to west. Uh, native habitats on site include Diegan coastal sage scrub and southern willow scrub. Uh, two, plant, uh, two of the sensitive plant species on the property are shown in this slide. Uh, the top one is the San Diego marsh elder and the bottom one is the southwestern spiny rush. Uh, you can see in that bottom photo, hopefully it's not too small, um, that the two of the, the biggest threats on this site are uh, crowding out by other non-native species such as the pampas grass shown on the right and uh, ice plant. So the main focus for maintenance, habitat maintenance that the Urban Corps does at this site is removal of these species, these pampas grass and ice plant species from around the native ones to just make sure that they continue to exist at the site. Okay. Uh, next one is the Poinsettia Place Preserve. This one is 11.5 acres. It's if you if you know of the new the new development uh, called the Poinsettia 61 uh, residential development. It's located just north of that, uh, in between that new development and Cassia Road. Um, let's see. The uh, it contains recovering uh, southern maritime chaparral habitat because unfortunately, like the Newcrest Preserve that we have. This preserve burned in 2014, um, but not all of the not all the species did badly. One of the the plant species I want to point out is the wart stem ceanothus, which is pictured on the right. Um, before the 2014 fire, we only had 11 of these plants noted on the property, and after the fire in 2020, uh, I counted 290 of these plants. Uh, the reason for this increase uh, after the fire is that this species germinates only after the seeds have been exposed to intense heat, such as a fire. Um, so that was a very, very good thing for this species. Um, in addition to the warts MC note, this you can see the other species that we have on the property. Uh, plant species include the summer holly, Delmar manzanita, nuttle scrub oak, and then we've got uh, California gnatcatcher and orange foot whiptail for sensitive wildlife species. So to protect these you know, species that we have on the site and the habitats that they occur in. Again, one of the main maintenance tasks that these core members do is weed removal. And we have had quite a, a sprouting of acacia at this site, unfortunately, and they have been in there with chainsaws, kind of getting in there and getting those out of there so that they're not uh, competing for resources with the native chaparral habitat. All right, next preserve is our City Ventures Preserve. Uh, this this 8.3 acre site, uh, if you're familiar with the Carlsbad Library on Dove Lane, it is uh, just across the road. Uh, it's kind of at the southeast intersection of El Camino Real and Poinsettia Lane. Uh, this amazingly, this site uh, escaped the 2014 fire and um, the habitats are, are doing wonderfully. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, two sensitive wildlife species, again, the orange throated whiptail and the California gnatcatcher and four sensitive plant species. Um, let's see, the, so the California gnat character I wanted to tell you, um, we've had, we've been monitoring this site since 2012, so eight years, and we have had the presence of the California gnat catcher at this site during all eight years. And in fact, <clears throat> we had confirmed successful fledging um, of the California gnat catcher in 2017, 18, and 19, which was just wonderful. Um, the four, so of the four sensitive plant species, the, the one pictured on the right is the Delmar sand aster. And we had a market increase in this uh, uh, species from 2019 to 2020. We had 662 individuals in 2019. And then in 2020, we had 828 individuals. So that was, that was wonderful to find as well. Um, okay, next one. Oh. 
Um, so at our city ventures reserves, here are our, our core members hard at work again. Um, <clears throat> some of the tasks that they have to do at this site are um, sidewalk maintenance, treat, you know, the vegetation thing along the edge of the sidewalk. They maintain the brow ditch that runs along the western portion of the site. And you can see it's a <clears throat> nice clean line there, that middle photo. There's a nice clean line of where the creeping myoporum on the left is like a landscape plant from the adjacent residential area. And then there's the brow ditch and then there's the native vegetation on the right. And they periodically have to go in there and cut that line because that creeping myoporum just goes right down over the brow ditch and creeps up underneath all the vegetation and just starts choking it all out. So they try and keep that line finely delineated. And you can see then on the far left picture, that's them again cutting that that line along the difference between the native stuff on the left and the creeping myoporum on the right. Um, so in addition to all the requirements that the urban core um, has to do in accordance with the preserve management plan for the uh, uh, city ventures preserve, they also had some extra money from their endowment that they used to do some voluntary habitat restoration at the north end of the site. Uh, this started in 2018 and they uh, it used to be the area used to be a landscaped area with some irrigation. I think it was part of the additional uh, adjacent residential area that that was abandoned. And so Urban Corps went in and, and cleaned that whole area out, uh, arranged for hydro seeding of the area with a hydro, uh, sage scrub uh, hydro seed mix. And then they also planted uh, five lemonade berry shrubs and 12 uh, prickly pear cacti. Okay, and here's a photo of one of our core members down in the restoration area. Uh, so if you look at that picture of him with his helmet kind of facing you directly in front of him, there's some yellow flowers. And then there's also some white flowers with yellow in the middle and the center part. And <clears throat> those are actually two different species, even though they're both in uh, the sunflower family. And so one of, the, one of the jobs that I have is to train these core members in the identification of what's native and what's not native. So the white ones with the yellow in the middle, that's crown daisy and that's a non-native species. And so this core member is in there hand pulling all these crown daisy out from around the native species, which is the yellow one with the brown in the center and that's California and cilia. So, so far the restoration area is doing pretty well. Um, you know, we tackle it as we have money, uh, but the planted species, the lemonade berry and the prickly pear cactus that are uh, shown on the right-hand side of the screen are, are two of the survivors from our planting in 2018. All right, and the last one I'm gonna talk about is our uh, largest preserve in Carlsbad. That's the 55.2 acre Southern Preserve site. It is located uh, just south of uh, Dank Mountain, if any of you are familiar with that area, managed by CNLM. Um, we have uh, multiple use uh, recreation trails and nature trails that can take you around the preserve. Uh, takes you around the non-native grassland in the southern part of the preserve and the Diegan coastal sage scrub that's located in the northern part of the preserve. Um, these trails are enjoyed by mountain bikers, horseback riders, uh, dog owners and their uh, furry companions and uh, joggers. Um, so as you can see on the slide here, we've got uh, three sensitive plant species and four sensitive wildlife species. And the two habitat types that we have, as I mentioned, are the Diegan coastal sage scrub and the non-native grassland. So you may be surprised to know that uh, non-native grassland is actually an important habitat that can serve as linkages to native habitats, can serve as raptor foraging habitat, and it can serve as home to sensitive plants and animals. Um, at our southern preserve that's pictured on this slide here, uh, the majority of, of our uh, sensitive San Diego Golden Star plant uh, occurs within non-native grassland on site. Uh, we also have southern mule deer, which is one of our sensitive wildlife species, and grasshopper sparrows, which is one of our sensitive wildlife species uh, that occur in this non-native grassland habitat. Uh, let's see. So as you can see in this slide, it's a, the, the non-native grassland is composed of uh, predominance of weedy non-native annual grasses. And then there's some shrubs kind of in the foreground there and they're native shrubs that are kind of scattered throughout. Um, but then there's also in the photo in the top right, there's a photo of some of the native perennial clump grasses. Um, and that's what uh, one of our uh, sensitive species, the 
the grasshopper sparrow likes to use for their nest sites, one of their favorite spots. Okay, so I'm gonna just talk quickly about the southern mule deer and the grasshopper sparrow and, and show you some graphics of what we found um, for them for utilizing the non-native grassland habitat at the Southern Preserve. So as I mentioned, the, the, the Southern part, so this part right here is all non-native grassland. And then this Northern part is the Diego coastal sage scrub. So this graphic shows uh, the results of our quarterly wildlife movement study in 2020 for mule deer. And basically that's me going out there and looking for uh, mule deer tracks or pellets throughout the grassland area. And, um, as you can see, the blue is from April of 2020, pink is from June of 2020, and then the orange is from November of 2020. Um, the, the ones that are higher up are basically along a little drainage that has flowing water. And so it's, it's, it's easier for me to track them along there because there's actually tracks to see um, in the mud as opposed to dry dirt. Um, but then the ones in the lower part, um, you can, I find uh, uh, beds in the grass that are laid down and then also pellets all through this area. Uh, next slide shows uh, the use of this non-native grassland by the southern or by the grasshopper sparrow. And this is a graphic showing the use of this by the sparrow over the last five years. Um, this is really a great find because grasshopper sparrows are exclusive to grassland habitats. And in San Diego County, um, Camp Pendleton was the only other one that I really knew of that had uh, you know, consistent grasshopper sparrow sightings. And this has been just wonderful to have them for the last five years. It's usually uh, two separate uh, males that I hear calling at the same time. So I know that I have at least you know, two on the site and uh, they definitely are clustered right there in that south uh, eastern portion of the preserve. So while it's not really, I'm gonna talk a little bit about you know, what Urban Corps does now to manage this non-native grassland. It's not really practical to remove all the non-native species that are in a non-native grassland, because as you can see, I mean, it's predominated by these non-native annual grasses, but there are some invasive species that we do remove that might preclude the use of this site by some sensitive species like the grasshopper sparrow. So here's a, a photo of uh, our Corps members removing artichoke thistle in the southwestern portion of the site. And they're using the clouds to um, you know, really hit, hit the base of the artichoke pretty hard, artichoke thistle pretty hard, and pull it out as much of the root as they can uh, before it goes to seed. It looks like maybe some of them had already gone to seed, but we try and get to it before it sets seed. And we're trying to eradicate this, this nasty invasive within the Southern Preserve. So that's all I have. Um, thank you. Hopefully you know a little bit more about the Urban Corps and what they do to manage the preserves at the Carlsbad site. And uh, next slide has contact information for Urban Corps and for myself. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Gretchen. That was great. It's really good to hear what's going on in your preserves. You guys are have been super busy uh, as usual. <clears throat> um, let's see now. The last presentation is. Center for Natural Lands Management. Before I pass it on, I just want to give a shout out to Marcus Spiegelberg um, because he, like Alana, is uh, moving on to new adventures. And so he will not be at Siena Land for much longer. Um, <clears throat> Marcus has been at Siena Land for 21 years. There's not enough time here to say all the accomplishments he's done, but you know, I think Marcus has been one of the most important reasons that CNL, CNLM has set the bar of habitat monitoring and management um, so high. And that is what was that level of monitoring and management and professionalism is what was envisioned by the wildlife agencies when they developed these regional conservation plans. Um, so he makes, he and all of the rest of the CNLM staff really make the rest of us look good because they, they really raise the bar. You know, Marcus has always had a very broad vision rather than just focusing on a, a preserve. He's always looking at the big picture of the species and the habitats. Um, and that's something I think we can all learn from. So we'll miss you greatly. I just wanted to give you a shout out. 
And now I pass it on to you, Marcus. Marcus, you're still on mute, just so you know. All right, thank you. Hopefully, is that all good? Roseanne, you can see it. Um, thank you so much, Roseanne. That was very kind. Um, certainly going to be uh, tough and uh, leaving CNLM and missing all of you in Carlsbad. Uh, all these present presentations today are certainly a testament to the great work being done across Carlsbad. Um, so we have a brief presentation. It's going to be myself and Brooke Prentice Decker. Uh, Sarah Godfrey couldn't make it, so I'll present for her. But on the call as well as our ranger, Todd Nordis, who holds down the fort for, for our uh, ranger duties and protects our preserves, and um, preserve manager, Steve Rink. OK, uh, I, start, I thought I'd start with the acquisitions um, in the last year. Um, Roseanne mentioned the property that was bought for her HMP or for the HMP credit. That was one of them. We call it Lucia. It's down here in the green and the bottom. And um, that was purchased last year and gave the city credit um, for their HMP. And they provided a stewardship endowment so we could manage it in perpetuity. And as you can see with the red lines, which is our existing preserve, it fit like a glove over there in Southeast uh, Carlsbad, San Marcos. Uh, and then on the top picture we have at the top of Dank, what we call Dank Mountain at La Costa, there are four or there were four private lots here in um, at the top of the mountain. And in 2019, we purchased one, the yellow box on the left side. And in 2020, we purchased the one on the right. So we're excited. There's still two left, but we're excited to add those uh, properties. And I wanted to thank everyone that was involved. So this was, both of these were um, Wildlife Conservation Board, CDFW, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Section 6 grants, um, but also included, um, you know, C City of Carlsbad participation, also included though, uh, from a funding standpoint and support, um, <laughs> uh, fi uh, financial and moral support from North County Advocates, Preserve Calavera, and many uh, folks who donated to our uh, stewardship fund uh, for the Dank Mountain, because those did not come with stewardship money, but also donated to help us with all the documents that were, were needed for this transaction. So we're grateful to that, and we're grateful to have more uh, habitat, and both of them are amazing properties. Um, the one that we purchased on the top of Dank Mountain had a burrowing owl the day that I went out to do the walk, what we call a walkthrough. And that's got to be the most rare bird in Carlsbad. So that was super exciting. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Brooke and she'll talk about some of our cliff spurge planting at our Kelly Ranch Preserve uh, near Agua Hedionda. Yeah, hi. And I just want to say, Marcus, we're going to miss you so much. You've been a you know, tremendous boss and great employee and great person to work with. So. You will be missed. Um, so on to the cliff spurge and planting that we did at Kelly. So cliff spurge or Euphorbia misera is a sensitive shrub species that we have in California. And I'm not actually sure how many we have in Carlsbad, but I know at our Kelly Ranch Preserve, we only had about 20 individuals. And they were really congregated in this dense um, population that's kind of in this drainage. So very susceptible um, to being extirpated by a single event like fire or a lot like we saw this year um, in terms of erosion, especially at that preserve. Um, so for a couple of years, um, we've been trying to figure out how we would propagate. We tried to use seed one year. That didn't work out so well. Um, so I think it was 2018, we collected cuttings from um, a few from, I think, each one of the individuals and then propagated about 150 cliff spurge through Euphorbia or through um, Musa Creek. Um, and we got those cuttings in 2019, potted in one plant pots, and we were able to plant those in December of 2019, um, about 113 individuals in two areas on either side of the road of Tolkien Way, if you know the area. Um, and then with all of the great water um, and rain events that we had, 
over the last year, I didn't even have to water and we had um, 112 out of the 113 individuals survive and that are still persisting today, which is incredible. Um, and then at January, I think 5th of this past year, Marcus and I went out and we planted an additional 33 individuals, which is the bottom picture. If you can see the areas where it's a little bit darker, we had just watered in those, those individuals that we planted. And so far they're doing well. I'm sure they'll enjoy the hopeful rain that we get in the next few days. Um, next slide. I think you have to do it more. Okay. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is our Threadleaf Rhodia pollination study. This is something that's been in development since 2017, but has been implemented um, the spring and summer of 2019 as well as 2020. So we were just really trying to look at um, the little what's little little known about pollination of Threadleaf Rhodia. So we don't really know what's going on with this species, um, and I was really interested in learning more. So um, in order to do that, we wanted to see if seed production was actually occurring. So we went out at three of the preserves, uh, Buena Vista, Calavera Hills, and Rancho La Costa, and pin flagged 25 um, individuals, of um, flowering individuals, um, back in May. And then I would come back again um, about mid-July to check and see if there was any seed production. Um, another thing that we would do is actually sit by the TLB um, for about 30 minutes, three times at each preserve, and just sit there and wait for a pollinator to visit a TLB flower. And then once a pollinator visited, we would collect it, and then I would go back and um, identify it to the best of my ability back in the office. Um, and then lastly, we wanted to get an overall what's kind of the insects and the pollinators that are happening in the area. Um, so to do this, we used a method called pan traps. So this is setting down um, dishes of soapy water in white, UV yellow, and UV bl blue bowls that pollinators are naturally attracted to. Um, it's thought within like an event, I think like four to six hours, you can collect upwards of like 60 to 90 percent of all um, pollinators and insect species in the area. Um, next slide. So this is just our results from this past year. Um, I just want to note that we, the, the, the great thing that happened is we are seeing um, those key species like the metallic sweat bee um, and the helictus sweat bee as well that are key species that are thought to pollinate um, TLB and we're seeing at least one in each area. So we know that they're there, um, which is great. And as well as seeing some other species like the calligrapho fly and um, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. There's soft wing flower beetle, um, which we see a lot of as well. So they might be contributing. I don't think as much, but definitely um, we're glad to see the bees there. And then in terms of seed production this year, so much better than last year. I think last year we only had two seed pods at Rancho La Costa, or two seeds at Rancho La Costa. This year we had a total of 62 of the 25 flagged individuals. And that was on 13 TLB and 24 individual flowers. So TLB have multiple, it's an emblem, so multiple flowers um, per plant. So that's why those numbers are different. I'm not seeing any at Calavera, but I'm not really surprised. We didn't really have that great of numbers for TLB there last year, even though we had pretty good rain events. Um, and then we also had some additional ones at Buena Vista, which we saw none of the previous year. So happy to see some additional ones this year. So at least we know that seed pod production is happening and that kind of gives us way to hopefully some good genetic diversity that's going on. And I will pass it back over to Marcus to finish the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Brooke. Uh, that's been something we've always wanted to know uh, about Brodia, and it's so it's super encouraging to see the seed production. Um, so on another endangered plant, San Diego Thornment, uh, most of you that come to these presentations know that we've been tracking them for a long time and also doing some out seeding. Uh, you know, this year was, or uh, 2020 was a crazy year, uh, seven, eight inches in April, um, really uh, pushed this uh, Thornment to, you know, uh, epic highs and uh, we, we even think there might have been some really late germination because of those events but as you can see from this chart the blue is the rainfall and the black line with the red dots 
are the trends. And we had record year here at Rancho La Costa, uh, 2,580 individuals, uh, way off the charts, uh, super nice, healthy looking individuals. And, and I think that's a lot because of rainfall, but also because we've been doing a heck of a job removing Centaria melantensis and other weeds. And then at Carlsbad Oaks, we also had a, a massive record year, um, you know, just off the charts, as you can see, uh, we've never seen anything over, you know, 650. So to get uh, over 2,500 uh, was incredible. And our out seeding, so I'm not going into a lot of detail, but basically we've been collecting um, seed since 2017 and we store them in our Washington storage facility. We do seed testing, things like that. And we did a lot of work and I reported previously on soils and weeds and just finding new locations to outseed. And uh, because our occurrences are, even though those numbers were good, they're all very uh, small lenses and it could be wiped out by anything. So uh, we've been doing this outseeding and I think you can see my cursor, but uh, what we've been doing is we, we found locations to outseed and we only outseed those locations once to see you know, how it progresses before we add additional seed in the future. So if you look here, um, within the, you know, the just uphill of the current uh, extent at La Costa, we, we put a thousand seed and we had really nice results, 55 in 2019, but it jumped to 195 in 2020. So we're really encouraged that we did nothing and the numbers bumped. Um, another occurrence, uh, just like 20 feet away, didn't do as well. We're not sure, we think it's very exposed and we think the individuals in 2020 just uh, dried out once we removed the weeds. Um, and Carlsbad Oaks North, the same thing, this uphill that we see because we see seeds going downhill off the property or off the lens. Uh, we had huge um, numbers from 250 seed distributed all the way up to 776 individuals. So that's super exciting. Um, shows that the individuals from the previous year, 2019, um, expressed a lot of seed and, and, and added to the occurrence. And then we had uh, a decent result from a brand new lens that's about a mile away. And um, we actually uh, had a small jump in numbers, but we didn't add a lot of seed the very first year. So that's exciting. And we added more seed um, in January before the first rains. So our thorn mint out seeding uh, progresses and we're excited about that. And then of course, Roseanne uh, mentioned the mountain lion. We got a picture in San Marcos and, she, and then there was a video of, that some kids posted and it was in the news, uh, but obviously it's a big deal. I'm just happy the mountain lion left uh, presumably and headed back. But uh, the fact that it was in the area was pretty amazing. And I think we have probably a million photos from that area. So to have the one lion uh, finally was amazing. And there was actually two pictures, one going out of the preserve first and then one going back in. So that was uh, pretty amazing. And then this shows where the picture was taken. So it's out here in the uh, San Marcos area, but it must've gone all the way across because this was November 3rd. The photo was on election day, I believe. And then the, this video surfaced uh, a couple days later. So, you know, that's Rancho uh, Santa Fe Road, pretty big overcrossing. So um, nice movement there, pretty exciting. Just glad that nobody got hurt and it moved on. Um, and yeah, so thanks to everyone for all the years of working together. So appreciative and I'm not far. And, um, you know, I owe a lot to Carlsbad, uh, certainly the best place we work in, uh, in San Diego. And I'm very appreciative and uh, I could, I could talk for an hour, but I'll pass it back to Roseanne. Thank you all. All right, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Marcus. And thanks everybody for coming and giving your talks. Um, it's really fun to get together every year and just see and share with the public what all the cool things that you're doing that nobody ever really hears about unless you give these presentations. So, um, and I'm kind of, even though I like in-person meetings better, I think the the advantage of this virtual meeting is that we can post the recording so that members of the public who may be working right now can have access to this information. And, you know, we're trying to um, educate them about the preserve system and all the amazing things that you all are doing. 
Um, let's see, it's 12, it's 1120. So I think I'm gonna take <clears throat> a couple of the questions that we have in chat just to fill out the time. Um, one of the questions was, our region has been slow to plan for adaptive management in response to climate change. Does Carlsbad have any plans to start planning for this? Um, and I will say from, from a habitat perspective, we're getting started on that. I, I keep trying to encourage everybody to think about these things and the, you know, it, it's difficult to do in, within your own budgets, but there's somewhat simple ways you can do it. And so two of the things that we've already done in Carlsbad is um, just as far as habitat management planning and sort of getting thinking about these kinds of things is the Batakitos climate scenario planning document that was done recently. Um, it's, it's sort of a scenario planning um, to determine because it's, you know, we kind of know what's coming in the future climate wise, but we, we don't know exactly how it's, it's gonna work out. We have some parameters that we think we can work within. So that is a document that's worth looking into. Um, it's, we, we call it the blurp, but it's uh, the full name is Batokitas Lagoon Climate Scenario Planning. And then <clears throat> we also did a climate um, smart land management plan for the poinsettia vernal pools, which also has a section at the end, which, which has um, a, a section that, that talks about potential scenarios and what might happen in either extreme. And there's a conceptual model and, and you know, thinking about what might happen to the vernal pools in case of these potential climate change happens. So we're starting at the management plan level. And again, we're trying to get all the other managers to be thinking about these things. Um, at the city level, we've not really been given the green light to do any adaptive management. So the climate action plan is, you know, that has not been given the green light to head that direction. Um, it's more like, you know, planning for GHG and, and policy and things like that, but that is the obvious next step. There is um, a grant project going on where they're, they're um, coming up with potential restoration scenarios for some of the coastal roads because eventually sea level rise is gonna overtake some of those roads. Um, so there's some scenario, there's some conceptual restoration planning going on with different alternatives depending on what you know, what the city chooses to do with the roads and stuff. So there is stuff going on in the background quite a bit. And then regionally, there is a whole lot going on with climate planning. There's a bunch of researchers getting together and they're creating tools that like interactive mapping tools and things. Um, there is like habitat evolution modeling and all kinds of stuff going on in the background. So. Um, so these things are definitely happening. I think San Diego region is kind of on the cutting edge of this. Uh, so, so there are some exciting things happening. Um, and let's see, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, another question had to do with Gretchen. Um, by what methods does Urban Core remove the crown daisy? They're curious about that. That's a really tough one. Crown Daisy. Yeah. Um, Urban Core actually most of the most of the habitat maintenance that we do is is going to be by hand removal. We don't tend to use herbicides unless it's absolutely necessary or if it's such a large area that it, it's just not possible to do it cost wise. Um, but nine times out of ten, the Crown Daisy is hand removed before it sets seed and taken off site and disposed of um, so that it doesn't you know continue to create more seed and expand at the site. Hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, and that's a really tough one because it'll just smother everything in its path. So, so it's 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 a it's a hard one to control. Exactly. Um, the only other question we have in chat is one about 
the San Diego, the County of San Diego placed hand washing stations with no porta potties at the head of QC site. Oh, uh, must be Quarry Creek. Please explain to them why this is not a good idea. I think that's the the police department, uh, probably the homeless patrol that's doing that. They have, um, you know, they're the ones who are who are. Uh, in charge of dealing with the, the homeless. And I'm sure that has to do with the COVID situation. And yeah, obviously without porta potties, you know, we're the, the ecological consequences of human waste and trash is, is not a good thing. It's, it's an ongoing battle that all of us deal with as preserve managers, as well as city, and, um, you know, all the other departments, you know, the housing and, um, health and you know services and all that so that's that's a an ongoing issue that's definitely not going anywhere um anytime soon but chipping away at it um let's see i don't see any more questions in the chat does anybody else <clears throat> any of the other presenters have any additional comments or questions or things they are dying to announce or anything like that Nope. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, let's see. Here's one more in the in the chat. Um, effective management remains a big challenge, especially for illegal trespassing. Needs priority. Yes, totally. Um, illegal trespass is one of the biggest issues. One of my biggest issues, just to let you know, is the unmanaged preserves, and I'm working on a long range plan, because again, I, I can't do it within my own budget because I'm not allowed to spend city money on unmanaged privately owned preserves. So I'm looking for ways to get the city to support us to help in that regard by creating a volunteer program, which was put on the shelf during COVID times um, and things like that. Um, so I totally agree. The illegal trespassing and the level of off trail use was never anticipated during the development of these HCP plans in the beginning. I don't think anybody had any idea the level of people pressure that was going to happen. Um, you know, out in the South County and the East County, they have these giant preserves that are, you know, set apart. Um, but we have all these little tiny fragments that are it's a mosaic within a, a matrix of urban development so it's it's really hard for us it's it's takes much more effort um uh let's see will the city be requesting more rangers in the next year's budget is another question that's a good question that is part that so the ranger program is in the police department. So we, we don't really have any say in that. They're the ones running the program. However, one thing I will tell you is I'm asking for money for more patrolling, et cetera, related to, to trails. Um, so for example, when the development goes in and there's a, a trail, I'm asking for money for you know, for that, the, the effects of having a trail, because more people than ever are using the trails. And, um, you know, we need more help and we need more funding for that. So I'm trying to spread that idea out to the other parts of the city so that they have a better understanding of what we're facing on a daily basis, which is worse than ever. It's worse than ever across the nation. And some of it's COVID and some of it is just that more and more people are, um, you know, outdoors and, and enjoying the outdoors. And I'm getting the message that it is now time to close the meeting. We made it to 1130. We even got to a couple of questions. So again, I want to say, say thank you for the participants and for all the visitors. And we will close it to next year. And hopefully next year, this will be in person. So. We'll see you next year. Bye, everybody.